The purpose of this lesson is to learn about how to store data in arrays, how an array can replace nested decisions, how to use constants with arrays, searching an array for an exact match, how to use parallel arrays, how to search through an array for a range match, how to remain within array bounds, and how to use a for loop to process arrays. Before we start this lesson, I want you to consider the following scenario. I have a program where we're going to ask the users to enter a certain number of grades and then they're going to input them. So in this program we're actually going to ask them for five grades. They will input the five grades and then we just simply store those in five separate variables. Alright, so I have a, a declaration here for num grade one. That's our first grade. And then we are going to ask the user to enter the grade and then we get the grade from them. So we start off the program by declaring num grade one, set it equal to zero and then we're going to ask them to input a grade. So if I put in 50, now our num grade one is set to 50. Seems fairly easy. All right, so now we do the next one. We declare num grade two, set it equal to zero, and then we ask the user for a grade. So we put in 60. Okay, declare num grade three, set it equal to zero, which remember when we set it equal to zero is the same as initializing it. Uh, maybe they got an 80 this time around. Okay, now we declare num grade four, and we set its initial value to zero. We ask them to input a grade, so now they have a 90. And then the last one, we declare grade five, initialize it at zero, and then we're going to get a grade of 75. Okay, so this is a fairly straightforward program. We're just simply asking them for the grade, and then we put it into a variable location that we've already declared. Okay, so this is easy, but I want you to consider something. Okay, so what I want to do is instead of five grades, I want to modify it to 10 grades. Right, still fairly easy. I want to modify it to allow 20 grades. Okay, I could do it, but it's going to take me longer to do it. Because what I'm going to have is with every grade, I'll have one declaration and one prompt. All right, so if I go to 20 grades, we're going to have 40 symbols. Okay, I want you to modify it to 100 grades, to 1,000 grades, 10,000 grades, or even worse an unknown number of grades. And that's where we run into some problems. So what happens if you notice we have a repeating process here, declare a grade, prompt for it. Declare the grade, prompt for it. Declare the grade, prompt for it. That sounds like something that I could put into, an, into a loop. All right, so what I want to do is I want to put it into a loop with a counter, but the problem is, is that I can't create variables by simply assigning this number at the end into a variable. I can't do that. Okay, so the question is, how do I fix this? And the answer is by using an array. And the point of this assignment, or this lesson today, is to teach you how to use arrays. An array allows us to handle a large amount of data. And what happens is, if I do the scenario before where we ask for num grade one, num grade two, num grade three, and so forth, you can imagine that when we get up to 10,000 grades, it's going to become kind of unmanageable. We're going to have way too many variables and we have to try to keep track of each one. And if we accidentally assign the wrong value to one of those, then we'll have some problems. So we need this thing that is uh, it's called an array and it's simply a data structure that allows us to collect uh, data items and we put them logically together as if they were one variable. But the only thing that changes is that each variable would allow us to have a value assigned to a number. And I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, what we're going to have is we're going to have a collection of like data types. So what this is going to be an array is going to be uh, a collection of grades or a collection of names or a collection of book titles or something like that. But they have to be like data types, types and they have to be somehow related to each other. The way that di we differentiate these is through what's called a subscript. And sometimes you'll hear an array referred to as what's called a table or a matrix. Each value that we put into an array is called an array element, and each array element is identified by a subscript. This works kind of the same way as a variable. Each array element receives its own memory uh, location, because remember, a variable is nothing more than a namespace in memory. But in an array, what we do is we're allocating a large chunk of memory to hold all of the values, and then within that location of memory, we break that up into little pieces where each element gets its own little chunk of memory out of there. 
All right, so what happens is our arrays will each be, or array elements, the values, will each be identified by a subscript. And a subscript is simply an integer, and it's typically going to start at zero and then go up from there. In some programming languages, such as Raptor, you actually start at an array index of one, and we'll use the subscript to identify which one we're actually going to talk about. You have to be aware of what programming language you're using and what the requirements and limitations are to that particular one. Each array is going to have a size, and the size is just simply how many values are inside of the array. All right, so we determine how big the array is when it's declared. In some languages, we have to actually tell it we're going to create an array that has six items in it. Some programming languages will allow the array, the array to automatically grow or shrink in size depending on how many values are in it. Some programming languages, we have to grow it. So like if I start off with five elements in it, sometimes I may need to tell it that the array size is increasing by one or something like that. Uh, we're going to put values into the array. It's called populating the array. That just simply means we put values into it. And then our syntax for it is going to include something that looks like square brackets. So what we end up with is an array is, imagine just a chunk of memory, so a section of memory where we allocate that all of these values are going to exist. And the way that we, that we reference these, they're all going to have the same name, but right after the name in a set of square brackets, you'll have a number. So here you have 0, 1, and 2. So if your system starts counting at 0, 0 would be your very first value. So some vowels 0 is equal to 25. Some vowels 1 is equal to 36. Some vowels 2 is equal to 47. And we can assign uh, values to these memory locations the same way that we've done with other variables. So what we do is on the left side we say some vowels 0 is equal to 25. And now what we're doing is we're telling it, hey, in this uh, in this array, which in this case here says sum vowels 3, this is actually declaring it as being three elements. And remember, the three elements, if we start at 0, is going to go 0, 1, 2. So these are our three elements that are in the array. And we can simply reference this based on its, num uh, on its subscript to be able to get the data out of it. All right, so after we declare it, then we can put values into it, and we can do calculations on these. We can take one array element, add it to another one, subtract it from another one. We can add them all together, stick them all into a register. We can get averages. And so in a prior lesson, you had to ask a person for five grades and find the average. And what happened was you created a register, which is also called an accumulator. You created a register where you stored the total. So each time the user entered a grade, you just simply increase the register by that much. But we didn't keep track of the grades. So there was no way in that particular assignment to go back and see what all the grades were. All we knew was the total. Well, if we were to use arrays, we can actually uh, keep all of the values and perform the calculations. So we get the benefit of going back and being able to display all of the grades and the total and the average for all of the grades. We're going to use an array to replace nested decisions. Sometimes we're going to want to do something like, uh, in, in one of our assignments, we were to figure out what the grade was. So if I typed in a 76, we first evaluated to see if it was an A. And then we evaluated to see if it was a B, and we evaluated to see if it was a C, and so forth. And that's called a range check. We can actually perform range checks with an array. So what we're going to do is we're going to declare minimum values and then we can actually compare those values together. So we will actually do this through some of the assignments today. You'll be able to see how this works. All right, so what happens is we had these nested arrays, I'm sorry, these nested decisions. And so in this case, we're trying to find out what department somebody works in. Well, we're going to say, does this person work in department zero? Yes or no. If no, then we go, is it department one? Yes or no. Department two? Yes or no. And so forth. We keep going until we find the right department. Well, what we can do is we can use an array to replace all of those nested selection statements, and we can perform a loop to be able to figure out what the actual response should be. So we can actually make our program much shorter. All right, so we're going to use an array to be able to find out what the department is. Now, you still will end up using selection statements. You'll still end up using loops. We can many times make our program shorter. Sometimes it'll be just the same amount of work. So for this particular example, 
um, sorry, it wasn't department, it was dependents, but we're trying to figure out how many dependents they have. And so what we're doing here is in this case, we have a number of dependents here. And then what we can do is we can perform calculations if it's department zero, department one, department two, and so forth. All right, so this, this would actually work. It would allow us to make decisions. It would allow us to figure out how many dependents they have, but we still end up with a bunch of if and else if statements and a bunch of selection of statements, and it gets kind of confusing. All right, so the main uh, benefit of using the array is that we have this ability to use a variable as a subscript, which means that I don't necessarily have to say array and then subscript zero, and then the array subscript one and array sub subscript two. What I could actually do is I could use a counter instead. So what I want to do is I could use a counter to change what my subscript is. And so instead of saying in the square brackets having a zero or a one or a two or a three or anything like that, what I could do is actually put a variable in there. And then our counter would allow us to increment it. And what we can do by that is we could actually make our program shorter. So in this case, we're saying is it zero dependence, then we're going to increase it by one. If it's one dependent, increase it by one, and so forth. And you notice these all do the same thing, where we're simply increasing the number of dependents by one. So they're all doing the exact same thing. But the problem is, if we're always going to perform the same, uh, the same action when we're done with this, why should we even ask them how many dependents they have, or how, how many of whatever it is that they have? So we need to decide if we really need to make a decision or not. If all of our if statements, if all of our selection statements are all going to have the same output, then we just simply ignore asking the user the question. All right, so we're going to use constants. We're going to do things like set the size of the array so we can declare how many things are in the array. Uh, we can um, put values into the array, um, the array values. And we're also going to use the subscripts. Now remember, like I said, the subscript is going to be an integer. Remember, an integer is a whole number. All right, so what we can do is we can actually declare the size in a, of an array. And a lot of programming languages will automatically do that for you. Some of them, such as C Sharp, we have to actually declare how big it is, and then we have to change the size as we need to. All right, so in a system that automatically will adjust the size of the array, it should automatically keep track of how many elements are in it. So if I have six values in my array, then the size of my array is six. That's all that means when we're talking about the, the size of the array. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the length of the array. Sometimes you hear it referred to as the size of the array. They both mean the same thing. It's just simply how many values, how many different values are in that array. All right, so like I said, we have some programming languages that will automatically declare the size of the array. Uh, we have some that will allow us to resize it, and then some programming languages will not let you change the size of the array once you create it. So be aware that with, with whichever programming language that you're actually using, you have to know if you're allowed to change the size of the array. All right, so let's start getting into what an array is. Okay, so an array is a name and we typically typically give it a singular noun name because we want to tell it what the what the array is actually holding and so in here for this particular example it says month and if you think about it we're going to say each element in this array is a month it just makes it easy to figure out what the singular noun is okay so for this particular array we start off with the array name is month it is a size of 12 so it has 12 elements in it. And then the elements just simply start. So we have the first element is January in quotes, which means it's a text string. And if the first element is a text string, the rest of them have to be text strings. So they've listed all of the months simply as text strings. And this is, in our array, our first element. Now, for, the, uh, for some particular languages, this would actually be element 0, element 1, element 2, element 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So if we start with 0, then our maximum value here, or our maximum uh, element, is going to be 1 less than the size. In some languages, like Raptor, January will actually represent 1, and then we go all the way from 1 up to 12. So you have to know what the smallest element is for an array, whether it's 0 or 1. All right, so what we can do is we can use our arrays to output things. So what we can do in this uh, particular example here is if we're going to output whatever the value is that's in uh, the sales array 
value number 5. We would just simply output it on the screen. Okay, I would get the exact same output if I declare a constant for Indiana. Remember, constant is just simply a memory location that its value does not change throughout the life of the program. And we represent these by a variable name with all capital letters. Um, so Indiana is equal to 5. So what we're going to do is we're going to say output the sales array Indiana. Well, what is Indiana? And it goes back up here and looks. Indiana is 5. So both of these would actually give us the same output. Now what this is considered is to be self-documenting, which means that somebody going through the program could look at it and say, okay, we're looking at the sales array at the element for Indiana. It makes it real easy to figure out what the program is doing. If we end up with something like sales array 5, what is sales array 5? That we don't necessarily know. We'd have to put a comment there. All right, so we can also do things like searches. We can go through our array and see if things exist. So let's say I have a, an array that has a list of zip codes. Then what I could do is I could actually uh, allow the user to type in a zip code, and we are able to see if it exists in the array anywhere. All right, so the way that, the way that this works is we're going to look at each element that's in the array and compare it to whatever they entered. So let's say I have an array with five zip codes, and they type in a zip code of 42141. Then what will happen is my program, I will take 42121 and compare it to the value that's in the first array element. Now, the, if that is true, we're going to need something to tell the program that, yeah, that is true, and we need to create what's called a flag. All right, so we'll get to that in just a second. So what we can do is we can ask the user to enter a number. We're going to input some number, and then what we're going to do is we're going to see if the, um, the value that they entered exists in any of our array elements. Now for this to occur, we're going to use a counter. We're going to allow the counter to increment by one, and we just simply started our first array element, check to see if it's the same as whatever they entered, check the second one, see if it's the same as whatever they entered, and so forth. So we're going to create a loop that will allow us to check to see if it exists in the list. Alright, so we have some options. We can say that if uh, if we go through the whole array and we don't find a value that matches, then we can display an error message to the user. We could put the input of them asking for the zip code into a loop, and we could reprompt them to see if, if it didn't exist. We could just start over and ask them again. We have the option of if we ask them to enter a zip code and they enter an invalid one, we could automatically put in some default value. And then we could also set what's called a flag. Now what a flag is is going to be a variable that is strictly used for the purpose of figuring out whether or not we actually found it in the list. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a flag. It's a variable. I'm going to set its value to no. So let's say I create a variable called isFound. And then I'm going to set its value to no, because at the beginning of our program, we're going to assume that we didn't find it. We'll ask the user for a zip code. And so what I'll do is I'll compare their zip code to the first element in my array. and if they don't match, we're going to leave the flag alone. But then we're going to go on to the second item in the array, and if the two of those don't match, we're going to leave the flag alone. Go to the third element, and if those two match, then what we do is we set the flag to yes. Now what this does for us is it tells us that we found a match in the array. It doesn't tell us anything beyond that. It just simply tells us that, that there was a match. And so what this does for us is if I want to validate input. Like if I want to validate that the user really entered a, a correct zip code, then what I want to do is go through the array and see if that zip code really exists. If it does, we're going to set some sort of flag to yes, and then our program can continue on with asking for other input. All right, we can also use parallel arrays. Now a parallel array is just simply two arrays that are very loosely associated with each other. So what happens is, in this case, uh, we have items and we have prices. So I have an item here. This is our item array, and this is our price array. And so what this would do is it would allow me to set a, uh, an item name or an item number and then a price for that particular item number. So if I were to ask you what is the price for item number 307, you can go across this array and find 307. And then what we can do is we can look at the corresponding location in the other array to find its price. So item number 307 costs $4.50. When we use two parallel arrays, they have to contain related data 
and there also has to be something that makes it where the the values in the first array are aligned with the items in the second array which what I mean by that is that if the item in our first array element in the item array is for a candy bar then the first price that exists in the price array has to be the price for that candy bar we can't have them out of order we also have to have the same number of elements in the two arrays you cannot have different number of elements in the arrays alright so in our program what we would do is we would just simply have two arrays and we're just simply trying to declare them we will actually get into this we'll build one of these programs here in a couple of minutes so if we're using the, the parallel arrays we need to make sure that we have some sort of relationship to them and like I said the only relationship between the two of those is just simply what is the subscript so if I'm looking at price subscript 3 then I want to look at item subscript 3 that's the only thing that associates those two arrays with each, with each other so what we want to do is we want to make sure that if I have two different arrays I have some means of comparing the two arrays and the corresponding elements in the two arrays have to somehow be related to each other. Alright, so the problem is, is that this is somewhat inefficient when we're trying to compare prices of elements because what would actually happen is our program would go through and if I want to look and find a valid zip code, if I only have five zip codes listed, that's okay. It's not really a problem if I'm trying to compare all five of them. But what will happen is if I try to compare all of the elements in my array, my program doesn't necessarily know when to stop. So if I have 10 million entries in my array of zip codes, then what will happen is if it gets to the third uh, zip code and finds a match, it'll set a flag to yes, but it'll keep going on all of the other array elements and checking every other one of them, even though it doesn't need to because it already found a match. All right, so to improve efficiency, what we're going to do is we're going to set a flag for yes it was found and we're going to use that flag to determine when we should stop our loop. Alright so what we're going to do is we're going to compare these two values and we're going to look at our flag. So we're only going to continue our loop if our flag has not been tripped yet. And then as soon as our flag gets tripped, as soon as it changes from no to yes, then we stop our loop and it makes our program much more efficient. Now we can also do what are called uh, range checks or range matches and a range check is just simply I want to be able to see what a discount is. So in this example if you're purchasing anywhere from 0 to 8 of a particular item you get no discount. If you purchase anywhere from 9 to 12 of, of an item you get a 10% discount. If you purchase 13 through 25 of them you get a 15% discount and so forth. What we can do is we can actually use arrays to be able to figure out what the discount is. And we're going to use two parallel arrays and what we're going to do is we're going to tell the, the first array what the minimum quantity is. So our first array will have an element with 0, an element with a 9, an element with 13, and an element with 26. Our other array will have the discount. So it will have 0, then 10, then 15, then 20. And so these will be associated. So these will both have subscript 0 these will both have subscript 1, subscript 2, subscript 3, and that's the only relationship between the two of them. But what we're doing is we're going to be able to figure out, based on a range, what kind of price or what kind of discount the user should get. And we will actually make one of these programs in a little bit so you can see how it works. Alright, so the drawback here is that arrays use a large amount of memory. So I'm going to store all of my values in an array. And what we're going to do is we're going to keep repeating the same process over and over and over and over again. And so if I have 10,000 different ranges that I can play with, and the range that I need exists near the end, it has to do all the other comparisons that it will finally get to the particular array element that I need. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to try to shorten this a little bit. All right, so what happens is if I were to use a very loose... Um, arrangement then what I could do is I could say that well our discounts going to be depending on the um, on the subscript so here our subscript is 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 and then this is 9 and notice what we're going to do is we're going to look at the subscript and say okay well if you purchased 
eight items, your discount is still zero. And the thing is, is that if you try to do it in this type of manner, it'll work, but it'll be extremely slow and it will use a large amount of memory. So what we're going to do, like I said, we're going to take the two parallel rays. We're going to have one called discount that has four elements and one called uh, quantity limit, which has four elements. And so our discount will be what is the discount and our limit is going to be what is the lowest number in that range. So if I have zero or more items, my discount is zero. If I have nine or more items, my discount is 0.10. If I have 13 or more items, my discount is 0.15 and so forth. And the only thing that associates these together is their subscript. All right, so one thing we need to be aware of is we do have what are called bounds with our arrays. Our array size is finite, which means that we have to declare how big it is. Now, like I said, in some of our programming languages like Raptor, it will automatically declare it for us. So I can keep adding things to the array. It will automatically make it bigger. But in reality, behind the scenes, the system always has to know how many elements are in the array because the system has to allocate memory to accommodate all the space that, that array will actually take. We want to make sure that whenever we try to uh, whenever we try to look up something in the array, that the subscript has to be a legitimate value. Negative values are never allowed. We're always going to start with either 0 or 1, and then we're going to go up to whatever our maximum value is. What will happen is if I have 12 elements in my array and I try to reference or display item number 13, the system will actually display an out-of-bounds error, which just simply means that the subscript number that I chose is not in a legitimate value. So what we're going to do with our programs is we're going to use loops and when we actually get into using C Sharp we'll use what are called for loops. In Raptor there's no differentiation between the types of loops. So just be aware that we're going to use a loop and our loops will allow us to go through and be able to validate or verify the information from the array. So in that previous example where we were looking at all the different dependents and how many they had and then we decided um, how many people were going to be, or uh, how many dependents were going to add up. We can actually shorten that. So this, this program here works almost the same way. This one is with departments. So we have, we have departments, and we have a size of 5. It is declared here. So remember, this is our constant 5. We've given it a finite size. And then the values for this are going to be accounting is going to be our first element, personnel, technical, customer service, and marketing. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go through the um, through this array and one element at a time we just simply display the stuff out to the screen. Now we're going to start using pseudocode to be able to list what is in our arrays. And when you do the pseudocode it will make it much much easier to try to figure out how your array should be laid out. So what I want you to do is get in the habit of creating the pseudocode first. Write it on a paper. Ask the user for input put that into array element 0, then output array element 0, things like that. And if you do the pseudocode first, it would actually make it much easier for you to make your program. What it does is it makes it where you can compare what you have in the pseudocode to what you actually put into Raptor and into whatever programming language you're going to be using. All right, so let's go back to the previous program that we were working on. We have numgrade1, enter grade, num grade 2, enter grade, and so forth. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep repeating our process. And what I'm going to do is delete all of the inputs and the prompts from grade 2 on. So I just want the first one. All right, so make me save. So I'm going to save this to my desktop. So you're actually going to do the same thing. Okay, so this is chapter, th uh, chapter 5. So Pringle underscore, and this is week 6 underscore and 1. All right, so what I want you to do is save this as your first one, and then we're going to modify it. Okay, so what I want this to do is I want it to ask for the grade, and then I want it to put the grade into an array location. All right, so I'm going to modify this. I'm going to put a loop in here. And so I'm going to need a loop and a counter. So I'm going to initialize my counter. Remember, I initialize my counter. We're going to call it K for the counter. All right, so I have a counter K, and then I have my loop. And what we're going to do is, in the loop, we're going to perform our uh, declaration for the variable and our um, asking for the grade. Now, the catch is, is that uh, in Raptor, Raptor will automatically declare these for us, but I want to show you how this works. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to declare an array called numGrade. 
Okay, so actually I'm just going to call it grade for this example to make it a little easier to understand. And so I'm going to put it as grade, and I'm going to initialize it as zero. But the thing is, is what is grade? Grade is an array. Well, how do we declare an array in Raptor? And the way that I do that is I put in a square brackets one. And what happens is in Raptor, one is our first array element. In other programming languages, we'll end up with zero as the first element. In Raptor, it starts at one. So you have to be aware of that, which means that when we go into C Sharp later in the semester, you will actually have to change your code just a little bit to be able to get it into C Sharp. All right, so the grade array, first element, set it to zero. That's what this means. And then what we're going to do is we are going to ask the user to tell us what grade is. All right, so in this particular scenario here, we tell it grade one. All right, but what I want you to pay attention to is that I'm not necessarily going to keep asking for grade one, because right now, if I perform this loop, the first time it goes through, it'll take grade one and set it to zero, and then it asks the user for the grade for grade one, and then whatever they enter becomes the grade for grade one, perform the loop again, and then we overwrite the first element. So we keep rewriting the first grade, and I don't want to do this. So what happens is that my, my array allows me, instead of putting a one here, I can actually use a variable. And in this case, my variable is going to be my counter. And so what happens is I want to make a loop that keeps incrementing my counter by one. So we're going to say, okay, the grade array element k, so the first time we go through k is zero, so we have to add one to whatever k is. So grade k, which is one, put zero in there, and then ask the user to input grade k. All right, so now in most of our programming languages, we would do this, and then we would increment our counter. In Raptor, we either need to start our counter at zero, or we need to increment our counter before we ask for the grade. So for this example, I'm just simply going to increment, increment my counter. So we're going to do k is equal to k plus 1. And that way, when we run through the program, we're going to say, all right, k is 0. Now we're going to add 1 to k, which is 0 plus 1. So now k is 1. The grade for element 1 is 0. So we create that first location of memory. Then we ask for a grade, and we replace grade element 1 with whatever the user enters. All right, so I need some way to get out of my loop. Well, my loop is going to be, I want this to run, um, we can enter three grades. Okay, so what I'm going to say is that when k is equal to 3, then we will get out of our loop. So we're going to go through, and the first time k is 0. So is k equal to 3? No. So we will run this. We increment k by 1, so now k is 1. Put 0 into uh, the first element in grade. Ask the user for a grade and put that in for the first element in the grade, and then go back and do it again. So now k is uh, 1 is equal to 3. No, so it repeats. So what this will do is it allow us to put three grades in. All right, so I'm going to run this. We initialize with a counter of 0. We go into the loop. We do a comparison. Is k equal to 3? No, k is 0, so we're going to do the no side. We're going to take k and add 1 to it and put that back into k. So now we incremented k to 1. Now we're looking at grade element 1, and we're going to set that equal to 0. And you'll notice over here in Raptor, you get this new little section with a plus sign on it. And what I can do is I can expand this, and I can actually watch the array, and it will tell me what the size is. Now the size is just simply how many elements do we have, and then this over here on the left side where it says 1, this is array element 1, and its value right now is 0. All right, so the next step is going to prompt for a grade. So if I get a grade of 90 and I click OK, it puts a 90 into that first array element. Okay, so now in Raptor, what will happen is it will loop back around. Is k equal to 3? Now k is still equal to 1. So the next step is we want to increment k by 1. So now k is 2. Now we're going to look at grade element 2. We're going to create it, and we're going to put a 0 into it. And then now that we have a zero there, we're going to ask the user for input. Maybe we have an 85 this time. And now our second element has 85. And if you notice, our size is now 2. 
So it knows there are two elements in the array. Okay, do it again. Is k equal to 3? No, k is 2, so we're going to do it again. Okay, now k is equal to 3. We're looking at uh, grade element 3. We're going to initialize that with a 0. So here it is initialized. Our size incremented to 3 because we have three elements in the array. We're going to ask the user for a grade. We got a 95 again, or 95 on this one. And so now we have a 95 there. And now we go back, is k equal to 3? Yes. So now it's going to leave the loop, and our program is done. All right, so this is our very first program. We're just simply asking for elements to put into the array. Notice I asked for three grades, and my three grades, I only had one declaration and one input. So I have one declaration, one input for three separate grades. It makes my program much shorter. Now I have something that we've talked about before. We have this magic number thing. So I have a number here where I'm performing my comparison and I don't really want to do that. What I want it to do instead is I want it to have a comparison of a variable to another variable or a variable to a constant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to initialize, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to declare and initialize a constant for the number of grades. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create num grades as a constant, and I want to ask for three grades. Okay, so what we're doing is we're just simply making a constant and setting it equal to three, and instead of saying that k, when k is equal to three, we can get out of it, what we want to do is when k is equal to num grades, which will effectively give me the exact same output, but now what I do is in my program, I just simply have one place up here that I can change the num grades, and even if I have 20 different loops, all of my loops will actually use the same number of grades. All right, so what I want to do is, in this case, I want to get three grades, so the same thing as before. We go through the program, we initialize our counter, we initialize the number of grades, we enter our loop, we compare. Is k equal to the number of grades? Is 0 equal to 3? No. So we go into here and we increment k by 1. And then now we're looking at our grade array. So we're going to initialize the first element, so grade element 1 will set equal to 0, and we can see it here, our size is 1. Okay, our first grade is a 90. Go back through, we loop again, is k equal to num grades, is 1 equal to 3? No, so we're going to go into increment our k by 1, so now k will be 2. We're now going to look at grade element 2, set it equal to 0, so we initialize it. We're going to ask the user for a grade, so... 88, and now we have our two grades. The size is incremented to 2. We go back as k equal to num grades. Is 2 equal to 3? No, so we're going to do it one more time. We're going to increment the counter by 1. We're going to look at grade element number 3. We're going to initialize it as 0. Now our size is 3. Ask the user for a grade. We get a 98. Now we have our three grades. And now k is equal to num grades. 3 is equal to 3, so we're going to leave our loop and our program is done. All right, go ahead and save this as number one. So it should be week six, number one. And we're just going to go ahead and save it. And then what I want to do is I want to save it, and then I want to do a save as. So I'm going to do file, save as, and I'm going to save it as number two, because I want to modify this one. All right, so you should have number one. Number one should be saved and then go up to File, Save As, and save it as number two. Now what I want to do is I want to do another loop, and I want the system to tell me what the grades are. Okay, so what I could do is I could create some outputs to actually see the grades. So I'm going to do it the long way first, then I'm going to do it the shorter way. So I'm going to make three outputs. And what I want to do is something like um, grade one is, and then what I can do is I can also append grade and its element, whatever the uh, index is. So grade, and then in this case is grade one, and we're going to output that to the screen. Okay, then this one I'm going to say grade two is, and then grade two, and this one will say um, this one's going to be grade 3 is plus grade 3. 
All right, so what I'm doing is I'm sim simply outputting the grades. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and run it. We'll let it run through. All right, we enter the loop. Increment k by 1, and you can expand this. What I would suggest is every time you run it, expand this so you can watch what it's doing. So 80 for the first grade, 90 for the second grade, 99 for the third grade. And then what it will do is it will output the three grades. So grade 1 is 80, grade 2 is 90, grade 3 is 99. All right, so the question is, if I want to change this, and let's say I want five grades. Okay, so I come into here, I change the number of grades to five. And then now what I'm going to do is we input five grades into the array, but I'm only going to output three. Okay, I need to make three or two more outputs. And I really don't want to do this. If you notice, these are all the same except for the number one and the number one, the number two and the number two, and the number three and the number three. What I can do is I can replace those with a variable. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of these two outputs here. And what I want to do is I want to put this one into a loop. Now, to do, put this into a loop, I have to reinitialize my counter. So I'm going to use almost the exact same loop that I had before, except instead of asking for inputs, I'm going to put an output. So I'm going to cheat. I'm going to go ahead and just copy my existing loop and then paste my existing loop down here. Okay, so now <clears throat> k is our counter. And so what we had to do initially is we had to initialize our counter as 0. So I'm going to copy this, and I want to reinitialize my counter zero again. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to have a loop where instead of asking the user for a grade, this time we're going to tell them what the grade is. All right, and I'm not doing necessarily grade one. I want grade K. So we're allowing the counter to tell the system what our grade is. So in this case, it's going to be plus, sorry, plus k plus like this. So grade space and then plus k and then in quotes space is space and then grade k. So what we're doing is we're allowing the system to automatically tell us what the grade number is and then what the value is for that particular element of k. So the first time we go through grade 1 is grade 1. Next time we go through, grade 2 is grade 2. Next time we go through, grade 3 is grade 3, and it will display all the grades to us. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my grades, 80, 90, 90 and then 95, and I'm going to pause this. Okay, so what we've done is we've reinitialized... I'm sorry, for this last grade here, sorry, we have five grades. I forgot that I increased it, sorry. Okay, so for the fourth grade, we're going to put an 85. And then for our last grade, we get 100. Okay, so now when we find out that the K is equal to the number of grades, then we're going to go into the next loop, and we reinitialize K back at zero. So what that does is it allows us to use the same loop, the same incrementing counter and everything. So for this particular example, all I have to do is reinitialize k, and I can just simply reuse that same loop that I had before, just simply changing from input to output down here. All right, so we're going to say, is k equal to number of grades? We'll reset k back to 0, so 0 is not equal to 5, so we're going to go into the loop, and then we're going to say k is equal to k plus 1, so now k, k is 1, and then we're going to output grade 1 is grade 1, whatever grade 1 is. And so now we get some sort of output like this. All right, so now I do this again. Now k is 2. It will output k2 is whatever the second element of grade is. And so you notice this is 80, 90. You should get 95 next. So there's 95. There's our 85 and then our 100. So our loop will go through. We can simply allow it to have five entries and then it will automatically know to display the five entries because I've used k is equal to the number of grades. That way I have one place to declare how many grades we have, and it will affect both of these loops. So if I were to tell it 500 grades, this will ask for 500 grades, and then this one will display 500 grades. Go ahead and save this one as number two, and then we'll go ahead and make the next program. 
All right, so I'm going to modify this one. And so what I want to do is I want to go to File, Save As, and we're going to save this one as number three. All right, so now number three, what I want to do is I don't want to limit the user because in this particular example, we have five grades. And we don't necessarily want to have five grades. We want to allow the user to decide how many they want to put in. So there are two ways I could do that. I could ask the user, how many grades do you have? I could create a variable with an input here to allow them to type in the number of grades. Or I could create a loop that allows them to keep entering numbers until they enter some sort of sentinel value. All right, so what I want to do is I'm going to allow them to keep entering grades, and I'm going to keep taking grades in until they enter something like 999. All right, so I'm going to get rid of my num grades up here because I no longer need this. And then what I'm going to do instead is create a value for um, what the escape sequence is. Okay, so for this particular example, I'm just going to call it escape sequence just so we can easily see what it is, 999. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say that when whatever number they enter is equal to 999. So what we have to do is we have to ask them for a grade. So right here between when the loop starts and the selection statement, or the, the decision here for the comparison, I want to ask the user for input. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say something like um, enter a grade and then in parentheses um, 9992 quit. Because remember, we always have to tell the person how to get out of the program. Okay, so what I'm going to do with this one, and this would be a little bit different, is we're going to tell it uh, that this is the particular grade that was entered. So I'm going to call this num grade entered. All right, so num grade entered. All right, so we're going to ask the user, enter a grade. So they enter 100. And what I want to do is now what I want to say is that if whatever value they entered here, which is going to be num grade entered, is equal to 999, then we can get out of the loop. So our new decision here is going to be if num grade entered is equal to 999. Well, 999 was our escape sequence, so I can say uh, escape sequence. So if the number, the num grade entered, is equal to the sequence, then we will get out of this loop. So we're going to keep asking them over and over and over again for a value until they enter 999. Okay, so what I want to do is I need to figure out how many grades they have. And there are a couple of ways we can do that. So before we try to figure that part out, I want to run this a couple of times just so you can see what happens in the beginning part of it. So we go in, we initialize our counter at zero, we set the escape sequence to 999, and then we enter our loop. And what we're doing here is we're going to enter the loop, and if they enter 999, then we're going to go ahead and exit the loop. So we go on to the next section. Okay, so that's not what I wanted yet. What I want to do is I want to make it where they enter a grade, and then we're going to take that grade and put it into this location. Well, what that means is I no longer need to ask them for a grade inside of the loop here. I'm asking for it out here so that I can make a decision. All right, so I'm going to get rid of this. And then instead of initializing this grade K and then setting it equal to some sort of input, I'm going to initialize grade K as just simply whatever the grade was that they inputted. Okay, so I'm going to say that our grade K is equal to num grade entered. So if they entered a grade, then we're going to put that grade into this location, whatever k is at that given point in time. And remember, k starts at 0, so we increment it to 1. So the first grade would go into grade 1. Do it again. Increment k by 1, so now we're on grade 2, go through grade 3, and so forth. And what this does is allows us to keep putting values into our array by just simply using a loop. And we don't necessarily need to know how many grades they're going to enter. We're going to leave it up to the user. So enter a grade, 999 to quit. So I have a grade of 100. Click OK. We have num grade entered is 100. And then we're going to say, is the num grade enter equal to escape sequence? So is 100 equal to 999? No. So it'll go into the loop. It'll increment k by 1. And then now we're going to say grade 1 is equal to whatever they entered in the grade. So now we have our array with the size of 1, and the first grade is 100. 
All right, so we go back through, do it again. Okay, enter our grade. So this time we get a 95. Okay. And then is 95 equal to 999? No. So we go into the loop. We increment k by 1. So now k is 2. We're going to enter grade 2. So whatever is in num grade enter, which is 95, we're going to put into grade 2. And there's our grade 2. Do it again. Uh, we get a 105. Maybe this person got extra credit. We go through our escape sequence. Is 105 equal to 999? No. So we are going to increment k. Then we go grade 3 is going to be 105 and so forth. So then we go through and we're going to ask the user to enter a grade. They decide they're done, so they enter 999. And then now it'll say, is 999 equal to 999? Yes, so we can get out of the loop. And then it continues on with this bottom part. Okay, but the problem is, is that I need to know how many grades there are. And there are two ways to do that. One is I'm going to create a, a register just simply to hold the number of grades. And what I'm going to do is, in my upper loop here, I'm just simply going to make an assignment. So I'm going to make a brand new variable. I'm going to call it numGrades, and I'm going to set that equal to k, because what happens every time we go through the loop, k increments by 1, and we're going to reuse that counter later. So we don't want to use k. We have to use something else that knows how many, what the value of k got up to in our loop. Okay, so now what happens is I'm going to go through and I'm going to ask for a grade. So 100, go through the loop. We are going to put that into grade 1. And so we can watch it put it in over here. Go through, put another grade in. And this grade is a 95. Go through, we'll put that into grade 2. Go through, we'll put another one in. So now we get a, an 80. Put that in. Now, we, what we're doing is we're keeping track of how many grades. If you notice, K and the number of grades are the same. Okay, now that's okay right here, but what happens is now if I enter 999 and I go down here, we're going to reset K back to zero, but our K is zero, but our num grades is still equal to three. So now what I can do is instead of looking at some constant called num grades, I want to look at a variable called num grades. Okay, so I'm going to come down here and set set k equal to the variable location num grades and then now what it will do is it'll know how many grades there are and it will output those grades for me so i'm going to go ahead and run this let it run a little bit faster just so you can watch it go 100 we enter another grade of 95 which by the way like i said expand this over here so you can watch what it's doing uh, we get an 85 we had a 90 75, a 92, a 93, and then 999 because I'm done entering grades. So then what it will do is it'll go through in this loop and it will do this however many times or how many grades we have is how many outputs we will have over here because it's looking at each grade that's in the array and it will output that number of grades. All right, so I want you to save this as number three. And then we're going to go ahead and do a save as, and let's make it number four so we can modify it a little bit further. All right, so in our modified version, now I want to be able to display our average. Okay, so we know the number of grades, and to figure out the average, we need the total of all the grades. So I'm going to make a new variable, and we're going to call this new variable um, num grades total, and we're going to start off with zero. All right, so I just simply have a variable location to hold the total for all the grades. And what I want to do is as the user enters a grade, I want to keep increasing the size of num grades enter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create one more assignment inside of the loop when we ask for the grades. <clears throat> and I'm going to set num grades entered. Oops. Num grades entered. And I'm going to set it equal to itself plus whatever the, I'm sorry, not num, num grades entered, num grades total. Let me make sure I put that correct. Yeah, num grades total. So num grades total. And I'm going to set that equal to itself, num grades total, plus num grade entered. So when we first start off, the num grades total is zero. 
If I enter a grade of 50, then it would be 0 plus 50, and we're going to stick that into the total. And what it will do is every time we go through the loop, it'll keep track of our total. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to keep adding up all of the grades that we enter, and then once we have a total, then when we get to the very end of our program, we can output what the average is. So what I can do is something like um, I can do an output of the average of all the grades is, and then we could do something like num average. Okay, well, what is num average? Well, we need to perform that calculation. All right, so I'm going to make an assignment here, and I'm going to say that num average is equal to num grades total divided by num grades. <clears throat> so now we know how many grades there are. So what we can look at is num, num grades, there's seven grades, we can keep track of the total, we just simply take the total and divide by the number of grades that we have and it will let us keep an average. So if we run it, 100, and if you watch over here we can have our grades individually, but we can also have our accumulator here for our num grades total. And so now we get a 95, so this one will go up to 195. Okay, enter another grade here, 85. This one will increase. 90, 92. All right, so I have five grades. I'm done. I want to enter 999 so I can quit. Go down, we'll display the grades. So we'll perform the loop to, pro to provide the output for the five grades. And then at the very end, it will tell us the average. The average of all the grades is 92.4. So this is similar to the program that we did before where you had to perform the average of all the grades. But in the program before, we couldn't keep track of all of the grades that were actually entered. Now what I can do is I can go back through and I can look at all of the grades. All right, so go ahead and save this as number four. And then save as and we're going to save it as number 5 to modify. Now the only difference between 4 and 5 is that I want to change one little thing, which is when I come down here to my second loop, my second loop right now is comparing k, our counter, to the number of grades that are entered. And the number of grades is something that I've performed a calculation on. When we look at an array, we really don't want to have to rely on some sort of register to know how many grades there are for it. So what I can do here is I can actually, instead of num grades, I can look at the particular size of the array. Now an array will have a length, so in Raptor we want the length of. And when you look at length of, what we can do is we can actually look at the length of an array. So in parentheses, you see here it says array, so we just simply type the name. So what array is it? And so what this will do is it will let us say, well, we're going to perform this calculation until k is equal to the length of the of grade. And the length of grade is its size over here, which is 5. Which means I could also do the exact same thing here. Instead of num grades, I could say length of array. And so this is grade. And so I can perform my calculation using that too. Which means that num grades goes away. I don't need it for anything. So where I had my num grades is equal to k, I can get rid of that. I don't need to keep track of how many grades we have when we do it this way. So we'll let the system automatically do it. We enter a certain number of grades, and however many grades we enter is the size here, and that set size is the length of the array. So when k is equal to 5, we get the exact same thing that we had before with num grades. And then here we take the total grades divided by the length of that array, which is 5, so we get the exact same output. All right, so if I run this, first grade is 100. Next grade is 85, and our grade array right now is a size of 2, so 95, we get a 99, and then 999. So what will happen is it will go through, and it knows the length of the array. So what it's doing is if k, which right now k is 2, is equal to the length of grade, which is 4, then it will let us out. So it's going to keep incrementing. It will go through, output our grades, and the very last time here, k is now equal to 4. So now when it gets up here and it performs our uh, comparison, it'll say is k, which is 4, 
equal to the length of grade, which is 4. Yes, it is, so it will let us out of the loop. And then the next one is we're going to take the number of grades total, our register location over here, which is 379, and divide it by the length of grade, which is 4, and we get a, an average, and then we just simply output the average on the screen. So what I can do is instead of trying to keep track of how many grades I have by performing some sort of calculation, all I need to know is the size or the length of the array, and then I can use that to perform other calculations. Go ahead and save this as number five, and we are going to make a new, a new program for number six. So we're going to make a new one, save as, and then we'll make this one number six. All right, so this one, I want to make two parallel arrays. And my two parallel arrays are going to be something like an item name and an item price. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this as assignments just so you can see it. But when we create our array the first time, what we want to do is we want to initialize all of our locations. So we're going to populate the array. All right, so I'm going to make an array, and I'm going to call it item. And I'm going to set location 1 equal to um, Apple. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to skip every other one is going to be an item. So what I'm going to do is item 1 is an Apple. And then I'm going to create what's called price 1. And we're going to set that equal to, um, this is an expensive Apple, so $1.29. Oops, I used a curly bracket by accident. All right, so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm setting an array, and the first item in this array is called an apple, and the first element in the price array is 129. So what, make, what that does is it makes these two related strictly by this subscript. Okay, so what I can do is I can look at this, and I could say, okay, what is the price for an apple? Apple is number one here, so number one over here is $1.29. And what it does is makes it where I can actually... Um, I can actually find out what the price is for this particular item. Okay, so now what I can do is I can say item, and then this time I'm doing item 2, and this one's going to be a pair, and our pair is going to have a price, and our price 2, because we need to make them corresponding. Uh, this would be $1.49, and then our last thing is going to be um, an item, which is 3, and this one is a banana. Okay, so then our price for the banana, so price 3, is going to be um, 0 0.99. Okay, so what we've done is we've just simply very loosely related these things together. So our apple is item 1, price for item 1 is 129. Our pair is number 2, the price for number 2 is 149. Our banana is number 3, and the price for number 3 is 99 cents. So what I could do is I could ask the user, which item do you want? And they could enter item number two. And then by doing that, we could actually output what the item is. So I'm going to make an input here. And I'll say uh, what item number. Okay, and then we'll say this is num item. Okay, so now we have the item number here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to output on the screen what the item is and its price. So what I'm going to do is item, and then whatever this variable is, which we call numItem, will go as our subscript. And then I can concatenate that with some stuff to make it look nicer. And then we can do our price, which is also going to be numItem because whatever item number they picked is the item that we want for both the item name and for the item price. Okay, so what I can do is I, I populate these in, so we create our arrays. We have two arrays that are loosely associated with each other, and the only thing that associates them is the index number. And so what I'm going to do is ask the user, what item? Well, item number two. Okay, well, item number two is a pair, so I click OK, and then what it will do is it will output a pair is $1.49. And so all it's doing is just simply loosely associating those two arrays together to allow me to get output out of them. All right, so the question is, what if 
I don't want to ask for the item number. I want to ask for something like the item name. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify this a little bit. And so what I'm going to do is I don't want to output this. I'm going to ask them for an item name. So instead of what item number, what item name, and I'm going to create my variable as um, str, because this time it's a string, item name. Okay, so we're asking them for the item name. We're going to put that in str item name. And what I want to do is I want to ask them for a name. So let's say the user enters banana. Then what I want to do is I want to look at my array and see if I can find banana in any of these items. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, all right, do you, uh, do you have item banana? And it'll look, is this first item one equal to banana? No. So then it goes to the next one. Is this item pair equal to banana? No. Then it'll look at this third one. Is banana equal to banana? Yes. Okay, now it can tell me the price. So I have a couple of things I need to know. First, does the item exist in our table? Or not in our table, but in our array. And if it exists in the array, then I want to tell you the price. If it doesn't exist, then we're going to just simply tell you it doesn't exist. Okay, so I have a couple of things I need to keep track of. Once I go through this, I need to figure out what the element number is. So I need to know that this is item number three. And the way that I'm going to get that is programmatically, I'm going to let my counter figure out what the item number is. So I'm going to make a loop. And my loop is going to be to try to figure out if we find the item that we need or if we went beyond the length of the array. So what I'm going to do is, if we find it, we're going to stop. If we don't find it, then if we've gone beyond the length of the array, then we're going to just simply skip. All right, so if we don't find it, then we're going to tell them we don't have it. Okay, so what I need is I need some sort of flag that would tell the system whether or not we actually found the item. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a flag, and I'm going to call it um, is found. This is the convention that your book uses. And so in this case, I'm going to set it equal to n for no. Okay, so technically it's a text string, so I guess we should call this uh, str is found using our camel casing, and it's n. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say in our loop, if we if str found is equal to yes, we don't need to do this loop. Or if we go beyond the length of the array. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to initialize a counter just like we've done in the prior exercises. So we're going to set a counter. We're going to call it k. Start off at zero. We are going to increment our counter inside of our loop. This is our basic counter loop. So k is k plus one. And so we're going to go through the loop and keep incrementing k. All right, so what I want to do is I want to know the length of my array, and if if our counter gets up to the length of the array, we need to get out of this loop, because if we go beyond the length of the array, we get an error. And let me actually show you what happens with that. So if we, if we go through this, and we try to perform a calculation to see if something exists, then we'll actually get an error message. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to perform a calculation here, and we're going to see if um, if the item entered here equals something that's in one of the um, one of the item lists. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say um, we want to actually let's just do an output so you can see the error that you get. I'm going to output um, item and then k. All right, so what I'm going to do is I want to output item k. The first time we go through, k is 1, then k is 2, k is 3. We have three elements in our array, so that's okay. But when we get to item 4, it should get an out of bounds. All right, so our condition here is to get out of here to begin with, I'm just going to say str is found is equal to yes, then we get out. All right, so when we go into here, str is found is set to no. We haven't done anything to set our flag to yes, so it's going to run through this loop. So I go through, I populate my arrays. So we have item and we have price. We create our counter and we initialize str is found as no. 
All right, so I'm just simply going to type in banana. I haven't done any of the logic yet to actually figure out if we have a banana in our list. All right, so str is found. Is it equal to yes? Uh, no, that's not true because it's set to n right now. So we're going to go into the loop. And we're going to keep going through the loop. So we go through k is now 2. And we want to look at, I'm sorry, k is now 3 because we, we up it by 1. We'll output banana. We go back through. K is now 4. We only have three elements in our array, so when we try to run the next one, we get an out-of-bounds out of error message that says that it doesn't have four elements. So I just wanted you to be aware of what would happen if we try to go beyond how many elements we actually have. All right, so I don't need this put here. Stop. Okay, so we don't need that, that output statement. All right, so what I want to do is... I want to perform a comparison. So what I'm going to say is if the value that the enter, user entered equals whatever uh, item k is, then we're going to change our flag. All right, so what I'm going to do is make a selection statement here because it's if. So if the item that they entered, str item name, is equal to whatever is in item, Okay. Then what we're going to do is we're going to create a flag, and we're going to we're going to take our um, str is found, and we're going to change it to yes. Okay, so we're going to take str is found, and change it to yes. All right. So what we're going to do is if we go through our items and they select something, we're going to change it. So I want you to see how this works. So we populate the arrays. So we have item and price. We're going to ask for an item, and I want a pair. So I do a pair. And so what it will do is it will go into the loop. Uh, is str found equal to y? No, it's not. So we'll go into our loop. Then we go into increase our counter by 1. And we're going to look at item k. So in this case, item k is 1, which is apple. And it will say, is uh, pair equal to apple? No, it's not. So it went through the no side, it went back up, and it starts the loop again. So now we go through, is str found equal to yes? No, it's not. So we go back into the loop, we increment our counter by 1, and then we uh, compare again, is str item name pair equal to pair? Ah, yes it is. So we go into the yes side, we change our flag to yes, and then now when we go back and say str is found, we no longer have to do anything. Okay, so I need to, I, I'm creating the flag, so that way I can get out of the loop. All right, so the question is, what was the item number? And the item number is k. So k here is our counter. So what I'm going to do is make a new variable to keep track of our item number that we need. And we don't actually have one yet. So what I'm going to do is create a new assignment. We found the flag. We set the flag to yes. And at the same time, what we're going to do is num item. We're going to set that equal to k. So now what it will do is it will keep track of what the item number was. All right, so now what I can do is if I ask for a pair, then what I want it to do is I want it to tell me what the price for the location with num item is. So what I can do is I can make an output here, and I can say uh, the price for a, and we had str uh, item name, plus is plus, and then now it's going to be our price array, and then what element do we need? Well, we need num item. Okay, so we're outputting the price for a, whatever I typed in, is whatever the price is. Okay, so in this case, this will work. I need to modify it a little bit, so I'm going to go through, initialize this, what item, so I type in pair, a pair is our second item. Okay, so we have our arrays populated. And then, so what we do is we go through, and it says, is str name equal to item? Okay, we just compared the apple. We go through, we compare, is pair equal to pair? Yes. So we change our flag to yes. Right now it's no, so we're going to change it to yes. Then we set num item equal to k, so we're creating a new variable here, so the num item is equal to 2. And then now what we're doing is we know that num item is 2. So the price for a 
uh, str name pair is price num item, which is 2. So price 2 is 149. And there's our output. All right, so we also have to account for if the item was not found. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to have two things. One is in our loop here, we're going to say if str found is equal to y or if we get up to the size of the array. So if I say or k is um, equal to the length of whatever array I'm looking at. So in this case, I'm going to look at item. Okay, so depending on the language, we either need to be equal to or sometimes we have to be greater than. So we'll find out which one it is here. And then the other thing I want to do is account for down here is if we found the item, we want to tell them the price. If not, then we want to tell them we didn't find it. So I'm going to make a selection statement that says if we found it. Well, how do I know if we found it? The way I know we found it is our str is found. So if str is found is equal to y, we found it, then we're going to tell you the price. Otherwise, we're going to say... Uh, something like item not found. Okay, so we're going to go in. We're going to allow it to go up through the array, but what happens is if it doesn't ever find it, then it'll try to go beyond the length of the array. And this here will keep it from going beyond the length of the array. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it an item like um, an orange. Okay, I don't have any oranges in my arrays, so what it's going to do is it's going to compare. So it says, is str found equal to y? No. Is k equal to the length of item? Well, k is 0. The length of item is 3, so no, it's not. All right, so we increment k by 1. Then we're going to look at our item. Is the uh, orange equal to apple? No, it's not. Do it again. So now we're going to look at element 2. Okay, so now is orange equal to uh, pear? No, it's not. Do it again. Increment by 1, so now we're looking at element 3. So is orange equal to banana? No, it's not. We get to the length of item, so k is equal to 3, so we get out of our loop. Okay, so now what happens is we got out of the loop because if we tried to go any further, if we went to look at element 4, we'd get an out-of-bounds error. And in this case, we're going to say str is found is equal to y. No, it's not, so we're going to tell the user that the item is not found. And so what this does is it allows us to go through and actually search the contents of an array to see if the item exists. And if the item exists, then we know its location in the first array, and then we can identify its uh, associated value in the second array. Go ahead and save this as number six. And those are the, are the ones that you will be submitting to Blackboard. In this lesson, you learned that an array is a name series of values in memory. They all have to be the same data type, but the only thing that makes them different is the subscript or their element identifier, so 0, 1, 2, 3. Um, all of our array elements have a unique subscript, but they are all contiguous. So we start at either 0 or 1, depending on the, um, on the programming language, and then each element will be one larger. So we start with 0, then we go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. If we start with 1, then we go 1, 2, 3, 4. But either way, they're all contiguous. Um, we can get rid of nested decisions by using the variables. We can use constants to hold array values, the size of it, or the subscript. Whenever we try to uh, search an array, we have to initialize a subscript. We're going to perform some sort of loop to test each element. We need to make sure we raise a flag to tell when a match is found. We can use the parallel arrays so that we can get data from the one array find its location, and then find its um, related information in the other array. We can also perform range matches, and then we can, or I'm sorry, we have to make sure that we stay within the bounds of the array.